O Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts always be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning's Gospel reading is one of the best-known passages in the Bible and one that is deeply appreciated by our church. I know a few congregations anywhere that take this lesson more seriously and to heart than St. Thomas. But I also imagine that there isn't a person here who upon listening to this lesson does not feel guilty that he or she could or should be doing more. This lesson is read on Christ the King Sunday when we look to Christ as King of our lives, Head of the Church, and Lord of Lords. It is a day of pomp and circumstance and also the last day of the church year. Next Sunday we enter Advent and begin a new church season, a new church year. And yet for all the focus on Christ the King, we read a lesson that reminds us that what matters most is what we do for the least among us as our gift to the King of Kings. As long as I have been rector, there has been a debate in our church about what we do for ourselves and what we do for others. Some would have us give everything away to those in need. Some pledge smaller amounts or even nothing at all and strive to give generously to those in need. The building, the grounds, the music, the teaching, well, others can pay for that. They struggle to see that without the church, its worship and music, spiritual formation and community, no one would ever be guided and led to serve the least among us. Then there are others who struggle to understand the poor and the needy. Because after all, haven't these people brought it upon themselves by being lazy or not taking advantage of opportunities given to them? These persons cannot fathom the obstacles that race, poverty, broken families, lack of education, mental illness, mass incarceration, and being surrounded by people without hope can choke the most promising of lives from blossoming and reaching fulfillment. We need to focus, they say, on taking care of our buildings, growing our endowment, paying our staff, providing wonderful worship and music, education and pastoral care for our members. These differing ways of viewing the church have coexisted for many years. And truth be told, both sides have points to make and all of us should be concerned about caring for our faith community as well as reaching out from this hillside and do all that we can for those in need. St. Thomas Church does a great deal to care for others. We host a wonderful inner city summer camp and send two mission teams each year to Honduras. Our youth group has gone on a Mission Possible trip for 30 years in a row. Each year we host a Harvest Festival and a Be an Angel Christmas party. Some of you cook meals and serve them at the Church of the Advocate in North Central Philadelphia in a truly blighted neighborhood. And others are mentors working with an innovative new partnership between Episcopal Community Services and our church. Over 70 of you volunteer great amounts of your time to operate the second Saturday sales, which this year has raised $113,000 to provide outreach grants. Every dollar helps someone in need. There are lots of good hearts in this congregation. Jesus tells us today, I was hungry, 
and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. We actually do not have a prison ministry at this time. And I suspect that there isn't an area of ministry where we could not improve or offer more. I suspect that as a congregation, we do not understand the Anglican Communion and the 85 million members living in 165 countries around the world and how most of them live in great poverty. For years, we have prayed every Sunday for the Anglican Communion, but we never have connected our budget to those we pray for each week. And I suspect that we see ourselves as a congregation serving God, but struggle to see ourselves as a vital part of the communion, one of the most dynamic worldwide institutions with the opportunity to serve the poor and the needy, perhaps better than any other global organization. We can grow in our service to the poor. Jesus reminds us today that what matters is most is not our churchmanship or how we worship. Although worshiping is vital and without it our efforts to care for the poor and needy fail to embody the love of God. The true test of faith is not what we believe or how we worship, but rather what occurs when we encounter the poor, the needy, the sick, and those who suffer. That is the ultimate test. Whatever you have done for the least of these, says Jesus, you have done for me. You may not know the name Stephanie Fast, but Lee Strobel tells her story in a book called The Case for Grace. Stephanie never knew her father. She suspects that he was a soldier, possibly an officer who fought in the Korean War. Born of a Korean mother, her beginning in life seemed normal, even safe. Stephanie did not know that there was no place for a, bi for a biracial child born out of wedlock in the lives of good Korean families in 1950. The night that her mother was given the option of marriage, it was clear that Stephanie was not to be part of that option. Her family members gathered around her. She cannot remember whether she was three or four, but they told her that they had found a family member who would take her in. It was clear that it wasn't going to be her or her mother's decision to make. Her mother held Stephanie and cried throughout the night. A few days later, Stephanie's mother put her on board a train placed a satchel of her things on the shelf above her seat, got on her knees, looked her daughter in the eye, and said, don't be afraid. When the train stops, your uncle will meet you. Then the train left. The train traveled, and it eventually stopped. And Stephanie got off the train, and in her words, no one came for me. As she stood waiting on the platform for hours on end, waiting for that uncle who never came, she heard for the first time a word that she would hear many more times in the months that followed. Tugi. Passerby noted her lighter hair and skin color. Eyes formed slightly different than most Koreans and wild and curly hair. And now came that horrible word to a child, not more than a toddler, that meant not one but many things, all of them bad, half-breed, child of two bloods, garbage, dust, alien, devil. As countless children in far too many places in our world today, Stephanie did what she could to survive on the streets. She stole food to eat, 
and found places to sleep, sometimes alone, sometimes with other abandoned children. This went on for years until she was about seven years old. She lived in a camp of homeless children who looked out for each other. They lived under a bridge in one of the largest cities in South Korea. The child that had been called Garbage up until that day merely accepted the name. She remembers the day that she fell into a deep sickness and was merely lying on a heap of trash near the makeshift homeless camp. That day, Iris Erickson, a Swedish nurse working for World Vision, stumbled upon her. Iris's job was to rescue babies from the street. Iris felt tremendous pity for this street urchin, but because there were more babies on the streets than children, Iris had been clearly instructed only to bring babies back to the clinic where she was serving. Stephanie was too old. So Iris started to leave Stephanie, but two things happened that changed her mind. The first, as she began to walk away, her legs felt really heavy, and she had no idea why. Iris tried to walk away, but she couldn't. And as she was trying to figure out why, the second thing occurred. She heard an audible voice, only two words in her native Swedish, which she knew came out of the mouth of God. Han Armin, she's mine. And in that moment, just a split second after listening for the voice of God, she forgot herself. She forgot what she was supposed to do. And she stepped aside and stooped down and scooped up Stephanie in her arms and took her to the clinic. As Stephanie began that journey from the garbage heap to hope, a new life began. Now an adult, nearly 70 years later, Stephanie is a Christian. And she says of Iris Erickson, she was my savior before Jesus was. You and I live in a world where bad stories are told. Stories that tell us that life is meaningless and humanity has no greater purpose. We read daily about people who feel hopeless and like they are living in a garbage heap. Their lives do not matter and nothing good will ever come from their existence. Some might even say that there is an infinite dark hole of despair outside the doors of this church. And there is no point in trying to stem the tide of those who despair. But Jesus says, no, go, they are mine, no one is trash, they are mine, hon armin. So go to Honduras on our next mission trip. Be a mentor for ECS. Become a Stephen minister. Take a tag from the Be an Angel Christmas tree and purchase a gift for a child who won't have one without it and come and serve. Help us to rebuild the third oldest Episcopal church in Cuba in a community of utter poverty. Or maybe just recall that person you spent time with this week who said that their life seemed me meaningless and invite him or her to worship with you next Sunday. Or visit that neighbor down the street who you know is very lonely and going through a hard time in life. Or stop being a stranger to your wife or to your husband or to your son or daughter or your parent and let the healing begin. Go, serve, reach out. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. 
Whatever you have done for the least of these, you have done for me, says Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen.